We, we will not need no rocks to begin to cry out your praises, my Lord Jesus, God, but that our mouths, my Lord Jesus, that are willing and able, my Lord God, will shout out your praises, God, that our hearts, my Lord God, that are beating, God, will be so sold out for you, my Lord Jesus, that indeed we will worship you, my Lord God. Jesus, we thank you if uh, animals, my Lord God, know where they got their breath, if trees and mountains even bow down to you, my Lord Jesus, I will pray, my Lord God that the very ones that you created in your own image, my Lord Jesus, God would find hope, would find peace, would find fullness, simply worshiping at your feet, my King. God, that we would desire, my Lord Jesus, to not to come into your presence for a little bit, God, but to stay in your presence, my Lord. God, that worship wouldn't be something that we do when we're at church, God, but worship would simply be something that we live, my King. And Lord, if we just get back into that hook again, my Lord God, let us to truly indeed worship. God, let us just to be sold out to you, my Lord. And God, let us to sing over the rocks, my Lord God. my Lord God <clears throat> the very bread that breathed into the valley of dry bones God and caused them to come alive their very breath my Lord God that breathed into Adam my Lord Jesus and begin to form his insides my Lord God and Jesus let us indeed right here right now God to catch that breath my Lord God above anything else my Lord Jesus that goes on here today God let us to catch your breath my Lord Jesus God, you will speak enough for each and every single one of us, my Lord God, so that not one will be left behind, my King. So God, we give you glory today. We give you honor today. We are so grateful and thankful today. And God, we just praise you. We love you. And we give you all glory, my King. And it's in your precious, most beautiful name. And all God's baby said, hallelujah thank you jesus god is good amen <clears throat> all the time hallelujah <clears throat> you know what's crazy man just hearing about uh 
uh, you know, catch his breath. Uh, um, not to start off with a sad story, but right in front of my house yesterday, uh, my neighbor's dog who lives across the street from me got uh, hit by a car. And uh, he was chasing another dog. And um, when he gets hit by a car, and so I run out and I said, uh, Cindy, I said, I think uh, that dog just got hit. So I go out there, and sure enough, by the time I get out there, uh, my neighbor's coming running down his driveway. The uh, van who hit him stopped and gets out, and uh, I ended up knowing that, that gentleman. And he's like, Pastor, man, I, the dog just ran out, which the dog did. Um, it, it, it wasn't the uh, driver's fault. But anyways, when we got to the, uh, to the road, man, the dog was able to uh, um, mosey on down the road by about 10 feet from my house, and then he fell over. And as, as we were sitting there, kneeled down by him, you saw the dog trying to catch breath, right? And uh, uh, the guy who hit him is obviously tore up, and the owner is tore up. He runs back to his house and hops in his truck, burns out in his driveway, pulls up. Dog was already dead, but he pulls up to, uh, to where the dog's at, loads him up, and takes off. And what's crazy to me, man, is, is we as Christians, we see so many people out in the world, and they look like that dog. They've been hit by life. They've been hit by sin. They've been hit by sicknesses. They've been hit, man, in the physical, and they've been hit in the spiritual. And truth be told, each and every single day, we see people who are suffocating, and they're trying their best to catch breath, catch the breath of life. However, they're catching the breath of something else. And I wish, I wish to goodness that we would begin to respond like that dog's owner. That it would almost send us not into a panic, but that it would almost send us into a panic that we have to begin to do whatever it is that we could do. The dog was dead, but my man wasn't going to give up. He was loading his dead dog up and bringing him to the vet clinic. And I wish to goodness that when we begin to see people suffocating in life, that we would load them up and bring them into Christ's clinic. Right, that we bring them into the church, but most importantly, that we bring them into his presence. And I would believe in the mighty name of Jesus that the outcome is going to be better for them than for that dog. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. But truth be told, the owner could have just let his dog laid there, as oftentimes so many of God's people do. Amen. We just let the people lie there. So I challenge us, man. I challenge us. To begin to allow people who are suffocating almost send you into a panic. That you are so willing to do whatever it takes to get them the help that it is that they need. And we know where our help comes from and that's Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Man, guys. Uh, um, but how are you doing? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. But, uh, man, we had a, a, a crazy week this past week, man, just with a, a bunch of stuff going on community-wise with getting back to school. Uh, we got some pictures to show you, man. We were blessed and honored, man, to be able to help out uh, uh, Pastor Steve Rhodes Church, uh, uh, Manny of Faith, man, and it was absolutely awesome. We were there. Father's Tabernacle was there, and, and Pastor Steve Church, man, uh, uh, graciously uh, welcomed us in, man. We just had a Holy Ghost good time, so we're going to just uh, uh, flash through a bunch of pictures, man. And, dude, they had this thing set up in an insane, crazy way. And look at Jen there. And then Jen, all Jen did was eat. Praise the Lord. <laughs> she, uh, she had 47 hot dogs and, like, 37 cupcakes. But praise God, she handed out a folder. But other than that, praise God. But, uh, but no. But it was awesome, man. But, uh, but it was just an awesome time. And, and to see the, uh, the group, uh, 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 hey, that's too mighty, man. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Stephen, Pastor Dwayne. But uh, I don't know why they have that picture. Oh, like, <clears throat> <clears throat> I, was, I was sleeping, I guess. Praise <laughs> the Lord. So I'm not quite sure. Praise God. But, uh, uh, but man, it was just, it was awesome. And uh, the amount of, of, of parents and kids that came in there, man, was absolutely insane. Everybody was so grateful. Man, it was just, it was just cool. And uh, one of my favorite parts, man, was just seeing the, the body of Christ, the churches coming together, man. So if you were, if you were there uh, serving, man, we truly praise God for you. If you weren't able to make it, but uh, you sent up prayers, then we praise God for y'all. Y'all are awesome. But also on that night, man, that was, uh, uh, what, Thursday. Also on that night, if you guys remember, we had the feeding of the international students, praise the Lord. And uh, uh, they went out to uh, uh, spy on some dolphins, poor yeah. fellas. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tori went with them, man, so we got some awesome pictures with that. And praise God, look at Tori. Look at Mama T. See you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Check this out. I, w- I want to point out this one picture. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's a dope picture right there. But I think there might be one. Is there one more? Or is that it? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I thought I had one up there of, of some like some dude just like it was a solo shot. He was sitting on a bench. I might not I might not have pulled that one up there. But this dude's legs, I wanted to show the picture because his legs were like mutantly long. <laughs> it made absolutely no sense to me. Like his legs were longer than I am tall. I know some of y'all his legs don't have to be that long. <laughs> Get out. Praise the Lord, but oh, they, look at that. That's not normal. Seriously. And they grow them like that in Turkey. I knew he was from Turkey. That is awesome. Well, no, not that one. Look how big that one calf is. Right? That dude is amazing to me. Right? Like, literally, if he was standing up, I could just walk right under him. (laughs) That's so awesome. Yeah, I have leg envy. What? What? Praise the Lord. (laughs) But it is. Even he's like, wow, dude. (laughs) This is crazy. Praise God. But that's just awesome. And I know uh, uh, Mama T, man, was telling me that she just had an amazing, blessed time. She was talking about how, how just those students, man, uh, were seeking her out, wanting to take pictures, although we think we were photo- she was photobombing a lot of them. But she says that they were seeking her out, praise Lord. So we're going to go with it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But no, nah, but the, rela- the relationship that she formed with them over this uh, last few months, man, has been absolutely phenomenal. And uh, it's, a, it's a bond, man, that uh, when they come back next year, uh, uh, God willing, it will be able to kick right back up. Amen? So it's awesome. And remember, guys, man, we have uh, uh, this Saturday, man, back to school bash, which is going to be awesome. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and again, we got uh, uh, a Manny of Faith with Pastor Steve. We got uh, uh, a Father's Tabernacle with uh, 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 Pastor Dwayne. We got First Assembly. Uh, with uh, Pastor uh, uh, Clint, which, which is their youth pastor, man. Manio Baptist, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, um, so it's just going to be absolutely awesome. We're going to have a great, great time. And listen, Heather King, who uh, just had to uh, uh, go out to work, praise God for, uh, for her service in our community, but she just had to leave the work. But she has some information uh, regarding some uh, uh, computers and, 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 and refurnished computers that um, we could also get for students uh, for the school year. And if that's something that you guys are interested in or thinking about the possibility of sewing into face, hey, right? Facebook message, Heather King on Messenger, and she will be able to run down the information for you. It's absolutely awesome. She herself is, uh, is donating some of those. So it's just going to be absolutely wonderful. And they, the kids these days need a whole lot of stuff. Right, like when I was going, it was pencils, pencils, crayons, and paper. <laughs> right now, it's like you need computers, and you need a dog, and you just need all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so praise the Lord. So, but, but hit her up, man, real talk. It's going to be absolutely awesome, and we're excited, and we could have those by Indeed Saturday. So it would definitely be uh, something that would be killer. Praise God. Hello, man. How many of you guys, man, want one of those action Bibles? You guys ever see those things? That's so cool to me. Anybody in here want one? Who wants one? Hallelujah. Uh, let me get Brandy. Let me get Miss Faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, we're going to do some Bible trivia. So we're going to get... <laughs> so that's what... <laughs> That's why I didn't ask. That's why I didn't. <laughs> yes. All right. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you guys three questions. Okay. All right. What What does <laughs> right? Look at that beautiful face. She's so hot. Praise the Lord. What does What 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 does Abram's name mean before he was changed to Abraham? And the sermon of. You guys want to call on a friend? Uh huh. Hey, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) 
<laughs> there you go. No, no, uh, uh, it, he, he turned. Praise the Lord. All right, what does Abraham mean after his name got changed from Abram to Abraham? What, the, what does Abraham mean? father of many. Hey, okay, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We'll give it one, 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 one. What does Jacob's name get turned to? My friend again. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Do you know it? Do you know it? Hey! Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come here, Jay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right. Listen, Jen, praise God for her, man, but she'll email us for Upward, which is on every other Friday, and, and it's a Q&A type of questions, and she'll email me these questions, which are awesome questions, and, and it also shows that she's digging into her word, but midway in the email, she answers her own question, <laughs> and then she just keeps on going. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, shucks, I'm going to use that in my sermon. Praise the Lord. <laughs> is that what that answer is? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But, man, we are in our third week of our sermon series, man, to God be the glory, called Old School. And it's been awesome, man. Last week was absolutely phenomenal. If you were not here, I am sorry for you because we just had spontaneous worship, and it was just absolutely insane. We've already got reports of people's breakthroughs, already got reports of people's healings, and it's just been absolutely wonderful. So we are super stoked about that, man. And uh, we have just been, been riding that wave, man, for this past week, and it's just been wonderful. Week one, we talked about to Abram how, indeed, he did get transformed or turned to Abraham. And today, as we just learned, man, we're going to talk about Jacob and how he turns to Israel, if you would. And if you guys don't mind, turn with me, which I believe is one of the most uh, popular passages of Scripture whenever somebody's dealing with Jacob. And it's out of Genesis chapter 32, and it says this. And he arose that night, and he took his two wives, somebody say mercy, mercy. his two female servants and his 11 sons. <sighs> Can we already pray for him? Thank you, Jesus. And crossed over the uh, fort of Jabbok. And he took them, and he sent them over the brook, and he sent them uh, uh, over what he had. And then Jacob was left alone. And a man, capital M, praise the Lord, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. The man is touching the socket of, uh, of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he, the man, said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, tell me, what is your name, I pray? And he says, no, my name is not, I pray. No, I mean, he didn't say that. <laughs> and he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the, uh, the name of the place Peniel. For I have called God face to face, and my life <laughs> is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the place, <clears throat> the sun rose on him, and he limped to uh, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on which is on his hip, uh, his hip socket. Because he touched the socket, Jacob's hip, in the muscle that shrank. Now, this is awesome to me. Because here he is, man, he's wrestling with God, right? Ultimately, that's what he's wrestling with. And, and my favorite thing to do with my boys is to wrestle. Right? I absolutely love wrestling. I will walk in the house at the end of our church days, man, uh, during the week, and I'll walk in, and instantly one of them, either Elias or Grayson, will begin to yell out, let's fight. And the moment they yell out, let's fight, man, it's on. Because I ain't never back down from a fight. I ain't about to from a two-year-old or a four-year-old. So 
So then it's on, right? And, and, and or the other thing is, is I'll be walking by just at the house, you know, minding my own business, and Elias will come by and sucker punch me in the gut, or, or Grayson tries to, but he's shorter, so it doesn't, it's not really a sucker punch in the gut, so it's like, hello, or hello, and, 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 and then the fight is on, right? So this stuff happens all of the time, but I absolutely love wrestling. I, I love it, man. I, I don't like watching it anymore because it's, it's, it's absolutely horrible. But I love wrestling with my boys. Right? I was into wrestling. I was into wrestling, man, when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? I, I love WWF and, and WWE and, and Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan. Macho Man Randy Savage slap into a slow jam, right? I just love that stuff, right? And it was just absolutely amazing. And, 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 yeah, right, B-Boy, man, that's, you see, I relive my wrestling childhood fantasies through B-Boy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but it's just absolutely awesome, <laughs> right? He's got his belt. I didn't even ask him to bring it. <laughs> yes, I'm jealous. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And I will challenge him to a wrestling match after this sermon, praise the Lord, because that belt is mine. Praise God. <clears throat> But, uh, but I just love that stuff, man. It was just, it was just, it was amazing. I, re- I can still remember, B-Boy, cover your ears. The day that I found out wrestling was fake. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, B-Boy. <laughs> but, but I, I, I remember, man, I was just about as devastated as when I found out that Santa wasn't. Right, right B-Boy, you with me? But man, when I, when I found out those two things were fake in my life, I was like, are those even my parents? This whole life has been but a lie. You know what I'm saying? And it was just absolutely horrible. But I love it. I love it with my boys, man. And my favorite thing about wrestling with my boys is that they actually think that they're doing something, right? And it's so funny. And, and, and they'll constantly ask me, Daddy, are, are you okay? Are you okay, Daddy? Did that hurt, Daddy? Are we hurting you? And, you know, so I'm like, guys, man, you guys are amazing and praise God. But you don't have to keep asking me if I'm okay. I'm good. You're not hurting me. And Elias is like, I'm, we're not asking to see if you're okay. We're trying to hurt you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shucks. You know what I'm saying? But this is absolutely insane. But, but, you know, they'll be jumping off of couches. And if we're in the bedroom, they'll jump off of bunk beds. I mean, it's just cool, man. And they, these cats are in it to win it. And every once in a while, not every time because I'm not a punk, but every once in a while, I'll let them pin me for a three count. And then they really think that they have done something, right? But in my mind, I'm going, guys, if y'all only knew Here's this man named Jacob, and he's wrestling ultimately with God. And God, if you would, is allowing him to pin him for a three count. And the whole time, Jacob, I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. And God is thinking to himself, Jacob, if you only knew. And see, with me, when I get into a wrestling match with one of my sons, and or oftentimes both of my sons, I know how we got there. And what I mean by that is when I walk in the house, they challenge me to a fight. Or I walk by and they sucker punch me, so the fight is on. So I know how we get into our wrestling matches. My question is, how on earth does Jacob get into this wrestling match with God himself? And in order to truly begin to find out how he gets into this wrestling match, what we'd have to begin to do is we have to begin to go all the way back to the birth, to the birth of Jacob. See, Jacob was, and, and was, was born a twin. He was born a twin to Esau. Esau came out first, but Jacob reaches his hand out of the womb and grabs a hold of his brother's heel, right? So right there, it was on. Yeah. Although they were twins, they looked nothing alike. Esau was red and hairy, and Jacob wasn't. He was smooth-skinned, right? <laughs> And, and, J- and Esau, man, he was a hunter, right? While Jacob was a homemaker. And Esau hunted for his food. And he, and he shopped at Bass Pro Shop, right? And, 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 and as well as, as, as Esau, man, like he, he shopped at Fresh Market. And he, he shopped at Home Goods and, and H&M, right? Hallelujah. You grow skinny jeans. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> 
And what's crazy is, is he conned his brother into giving him his birthright all over a bowl of soup. Right. And, and, and just so you know, a birthright man was something huge. You took leadership of the family when, when pops passed away. Right. So he begins to deceive his brother in this. And then he goes on to deceive his father who was on his deathbed with with continuing to give him the, uh, 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 the, the birthright and continuing to give him the blessings. Right. And, and the blessings that the father would be giving you to the firstborn is double the inheritance. You get double as the firstborn than anybody else in the family, right? So here's Jacob, and he's deceiving his brother. See, Esau was dad's favorite. Jacob was mommy's favorite. My sister is both of my parents' favorite. Right? So, so, so it's crazy. And, and here's his mom, and his mom begins to help Jacob to deceive his dad. They wrap his arms with fur so that if his dad reached out and began to touch his arms, and he would literally begin to believe that it was Esau. When Esau begins to find out what it is that Jacob does, man, he's furious, and he, he, he seeks revenge. He wants to, he desires to kill his brother. So what mom and dad have to do, legally blind dad, death bed dying dad and mom have to begin to send Jacob off, right? Because they know what, what Esau is wanting to do. So now there's division amongst the family, not just division because of favoritism, but also now division because of revenge, a, a, a plot to kill, right? But also division with separation, Mom, who her favorite Jacob, is now never going to see her son again. Supposed to go away for just a matter of days, but yet 20 years go by. He ends up, man, in, in Syria. He's, he's, he's heading there to where his uncle is. But on the way there, man, he gets a little sleepy. He gets a little tired in his route, man, so he decides to find rest. And he lays his head upon a pillow, or actually a stone. But this is what took place in Genesis 28. It says this. He took one of the stones there, and he set it under his head, and he lay down to sleep. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground, and it reached all the way up to the sky. Angels of God were going up and coming down on it. Then, right, uh, then, uh, uh, then God was right before him, saying, I am God, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. What's so powerful to me about that is you notice that God did not say, I am the God of Abraham, your father. I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. He didn't say that. He mentions Abraham, and he mentions Isaac. And the reason why he doesn't mention Jacob himself is because God wasn't his God. He was desiring to be, but he wasn't. See, Jacob's a con artist. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's running from life. And he's running from God in his life. What is it in your life that has you running? What is it in your life that has you running from the calling of God? What is it in your life that has you running from the anointing of God? What is it in your life that has you running from the blessings of God? What is it that has you running day in and day out? This is where Jacob said, and God's desiring to get his attention. And see, if you're here today, man, if you think that you're such a deceiver, such a liar, such a con artist, and maybe you are, maybe you're really good at it. But if you're thinking to yourself that because of those things, there's no way that, that God can be your God, let me please prove you wrong. The very land that Jacob was desiring to inherit due to deceiving his family by stealing the blessings is now the very land that he's fleeing from. But what's so amazing about my God is, is God didn't write him off. God didn't just, just do away with you. This is why God is my God, because my God did not write me off. God intervenes, and what he does is so amazing. He takes this promise that he had given Abraham, and he renews it for Isaac, right? And then he renews it for Jacob, this deceiver, this, this liar. And ultimately what God is telling him is he's saying, look, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. But you know what, Jacob? I want to be your God too. See, I pick you. Will you pick me? He goes on and it says, I'm giving the ground on which you are sleeping to you and your descendants. 
Your descendants will be as dust to the earth. They're stretched out from uh, west to east and from north to south. All the families of the earth will bless themselves in you and your descendants. Yes, I'll stay with you. I'll protect you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this very ground. I'll stick with you until I'm done with everything that I've promised you. Here's this liar, this thief, this conniving, deceitful little punk, right? But yet, on the other hand, here's this amazing God who gives this phenomenal promise that he is so willing to stay with him that he is so willing to take care of him here's here's god and god is telling him that he plans on bringing him back to where he desired him to be in the first place god promised to do to jacob what jacob could not do to himself to bless him to protect him to bring him on back home and i'm here to tell you i promise you that god promises you to do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. See, some of you, you can't love yourself, hallelujah, but God promises to love you. You can't heal yourself, but God promises to heal you. He says, by his stripes, you can't deliver yourself, but my God says, I will deliver you. You can't protect yourself. If you could, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Hello, but you can't protect yourself from sin. But yet my God says, I will protect you. See, and here's the amazing thing, is my God doesn't expect us to be perfect in order to receive his promises. My God never one time asked us to come up to him. He was so willing to come down to us because he knew we would never get up to where he is, so he came down to where we are. And what's so crazy is there was absolutely, positively nothing that we can do. Nothing that we can do that one will separate us from the love of God. And two, that will keep him from keeping his promises to us. Now, understand, you can hinder that. We, we, we learned that with Abraham, right? 25 years goes by on a promise, but that was because Abraham continued to interfere. So we can interfere with the timing, I believe, of God's promises. But ultimately, his promises are going to be delivered. Why? Because he is the ultimate promise keeper. See, in 2 Timothy 2.13, it lets us know that even in our faithlessness, when we are so faithless, that he is still oh so faithful. And it's absolutely amazing. Here's Jacob, and, and he begins to wake up from this dream, and you would imagine that, that he would be super stoked. And he'd be pumped about, about this dream, about this vision that he just had about being in the presence of God. But truth be told, he wasn't pumped, he wasn't stoked, he was scared. And we ask ourselves, well, why is it that he was scared? And ultimately, let's be real with ourselves, man. When we're in sin, the last person we want to have a face-to-face -face encounter with is God himself. <laughs> right? Why? Because when we have a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ, when we know we ain't doing right, when we know we're face down in sin, and we know it's voluntarily, then our sin and our guilt instantly becomes exposed. And we don't like that. We don't like to be called out. But truth be told, we need, to be, we need to come to a place in our life that we desire for our sin to be exposed. So that then we can honestly, truly recognize that we are in desperate need of Jesus Christ to remove our sin so that he can replace it with his grace. So he's not wanting to shoot you down. He's wanting to replace it with his grace. Yeah, some of y'all just probably uh, seen in Arkansas how at the courthouse they delivered the, uh, uh, the a satanic group out there, delivered the uh, uh, a satanic statue, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, going to be moved, but that's where they had the uh, um, um, un unrevealing of it, or the revealing of it. But, um, and, and, and people are in an uproar. And my thing is, Why? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I get what they're doing, but we as Christians shouldn't take to the streets and bashing them. We should take to our knees and praying for them. Right? We should begin to intervene in the way that Christ Jesus would, not running our cars into it, not bashing on somebody. Because you know what? The very cult leader himself, Jesus Christ, is madly and passionately in love with. He loves him as much as he loves you. And just like Jacob, 
I promise you, God doesn't desire to do away with him. God desires to embrace him and bring him into the life that God truly desired and created for him. And you know what? We as God's people have to begin to seek Christ on how we can truly begin to intervene for people who don't know Jesus. Instead of bashing, instead of finger pointing, instead of coming against. Now let us do what it is that Christ Jesus indeed would do. Pray that they have a face-to-face encounter with Christ so that their sin, their hate, can be replaced with his grace and indeed his love. And here's Jacob, and, and here in a second we'll see how he's, he's finally coming to his senses. Right? He, he's made a number of bad, uh, uh, of, of, of bad uh, choices, a number of, of crazy mistakes, but he's finally making a good choice, right? And, and, and you think about it, man, that's so many of us. We've, so many people in here have been the prodigal son. We've been the prodigal daughter. But to God be the glory, we came to our senses. And it says this, Jacob vowed, if God stands by me and protects me on this journey on which I'm setting out, keeps me in food and in clothing, and brings me back in one piece to my father's house, this God will be my God. This stone that I have set up in a memorial pillar uh, will mark this as a place where God lives. And everything you give me, I'll return a tenth to you. Now think about this. This is absolutely, I mean, you can literally see the change. He vowed a promise to God that he would tithe. Oh, you're going to stop talking about tithing. <laughs> <clears throat> what I am saying is there's pure evidence in a commitment to God in your tithing. But, praise the Lord, this is deeper than money. See, this is the taker. This is the deceiver who is now promising to become the giver and the blesser. See, for some of us, our problem is simple. We have been taking for far too long, and we are not giving at all. Right, so that's some of our problems right there. If we would simply be willing to become the giver and then step back and we'd be forced to watch how God will then begin to give you stuff to give away to others. If we would simply become the giver. The truth is, man, we want to take blessings from God, but we don't want to hand out blessings of God. Right? And that's where Jacob is. But yet when we see this in Scripture, man, he shows us something else that tells us of a change. He builds an altar, and he worships there. And if you continue on, man, he, he pours out oil. The only thing he had, the only thing he had of value, he pours it out on this altar to God. So let me ask you, on the altar, whether it's at church or the altar in life when you're seeking Christ, what is it that you're pouring out? When you come up to that altar, man, what is it that you're pouring out to God? Are you giving him everything of value? Are you just pouring out everything you have to God? Or is it simply a little dabble, do you? <laughs> right? I mean, think about it, man. The church, and, 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 and we do, man, because we, we know what people will say. But we put a little bit of oil on our hands when we're praying for somebody. Back in the day, they drenched you with oil. <laughs> now it's like, little dab, boom, you good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? But in life, man, do we do the same in the spiritual? Do we pour out everything at the altar? Or is it just simply a little dab would do you? In other words, are you a deceiver or a worshiper? Because if we're just doing a little dab would do you, then truth be told, we're a deceiver. Because we're not wanting to pour everything out that's already Christ's anyway. And ultimately what Christ knows. See, we think that we could keep things from Christ. I promise you we can't. When Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden, newsflash, they weren't hiding. <laughs> he knew where they were. If you've ever played hide-and-go-seek with my sister, that's Adam and Eve hiding from God. <laughs> You're like, wow, I wonder where my sister is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But it's crazy. So are we a deceiver indeed or are we a worshiper? And what's awesome, man, this altar is significant because he names it Bethel, which, is, which means the house of God. But what's so cool is this wasn't a house. This wasn't a building. Truth be told, it was the side of a mountain. But it was the side of the mountain that he met God himself. Where was it that you met God? Do you know that that statistically proven, 
Now, I know that you could have your way with statistics, but statistically proven, man, that more people meet Christ in the house of God than anywhere else. More than at revival services and tents or, or more than street ministry, which we love. But, but above all of that, all that stuff, more than mission trips and so on and so forth, more people come to Christ around the world in the house of God than anywhere else. Where did you meet God? How indeed did you meet God? And what have you done since? You've met him. Ed Hudson is an amazing man of God, and he says this quote, and I love it. He says that our relationship to God runs parallel with our, 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 I'm sorry, our relationship to the house of God runs parallel to our relationship with God. And I agree. Some people won't, but then it shows you what your relationship is with the house of God. But he says this, when we are in a tight relationship with God, we enjoy the house of God. I'll go on to say, when we're in a tight relationship with God, we enjoy serving the house of God. We enjoy being at the house of God. We enjoy uh, giving to the house of God. When we are not in a tight relationship with God, we don't want to be in the house of God. We don't want to serve at the house of God. We don't want to give into the house of God. See, nine times out of ten, you can tell somebody's relationship with Christ by their relationship with the church. Well, hold on, Pastor. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No doubt. You also don't need a parachute to jump out of an airplane, but I promise you it's going to work a whole lot better for you. (laughs) Hello. Nine times out of ten, man, when somebody begins to tell you that they've done away with church, a.k.a. what they're saying is they've stepped away from God. Because if they hadn't, then they would actually begin to listen to God and the importance that he talks about the church. Kills me when people say, God told me to leave the church, Pastor. Okay, well, where are you going? Well, right now, the uh, uh, church in my living room. Okay, well, uh, newsflash, that's not the Lord because that goes against his word. So we can begin to tell where people stand with God with a need, where they stand with the church. See, God's house should be one of, I'm not saying the, but God's house should be one of the most important places to us. And we're going to get to this wrestling match, I promise. But, but something else begins to happen, right? You know that old saying, man, what, what, what comes around goes around? Elias, not too long ago, deceived his brother like crazy. He, he takes a sip drink, and a, a cup, and he drinks all the stuff out of the cup. He sneaks into his bedroom, and he pees into the sip cup. That's what I said. And then he told his brother that it was chocolate milk. If you know Grayson, Grayson's favorite drink is chocolate milk. So he grabs this pee cup, and he begins to take a drink, spits it out, and then begins to say, ah, Elias pee, right? So needless to say, Elias got into some serious trouble. So later on that night, I'm sitting in a chair, and Elias is sitting next to me, and, and, and we were again talking about what took place. And he says, I tell him that it was bedtime, and he says, Daddy, I'm, I'm thirsty. I said, you are? And he said, yeah. I said, well, how would you like me to take a sip cup, pee in it, and make you drink it? Dad, that, that's, that's disgusting. That, that wouldn't be nice at all. I said, exactly, and that's what you did to your brother. I said, so don't ever do that again. I said, because, see, here's the thing. Your brother's not going to forget that. I said, and what comes around goes around. So how about just the other day, Elias is in the bathroom. He just got done in the shower, and he's in the bathroom. Grayson comes running in there and stands behind him, and you could just see the smirk on Grayson's face. (laughs) Grayson's learning how to aim. So what he does from the back of his neck all the way down, he pees on his brother. (laughs) (laughs) And Elias... Elias is slammed, tore up. I'm like, did you taste it? No, then it won't that bad, was it? <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? So what comes around goes around. And now, and now here's Jacob. Here's Jacob, and, and, and he, meets this, he meets this girl in, in, in this journey. He meets this girl, Rachel, and he falls in love with her, right? And it's his uncle's daughter. Yeah, so you do the math. <clears throat> so, kissing cousins. So, what begins to happen, as, as, and, and so he, he vows to marry her, and before he can marry her, what goes around comes around, his uncle deceives him. And his uncle tricks him into marrying his other daughter. So I guess he ma- ended up first marrying the uglier cousin, 
you know, how, how's that? If you're going to pick your cousins, I guess you're going to pick the prettiest one. So, so here he is, and, and, and he ends up marrying. He, he wants Rachel, but he ends up marrying Leah, and, 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 and Jacob makes this huge mistake. And the huge mistake is instead of seeking God's will, instead of asking to see what it is that God was wanting to do, waiting to see if, if this cousin was actually the girl that God had in store for him, he takes matters into his own hands. Anybody ever do that? You bypass Christ and you just take matters into your own hands, right? And, and ultimately what begins to happen is he creates a bigger mess than even before. In Genesis 29, it lets us know that he makes this decision without seeking the counsel of God, without praying about it, without asking, without asking God what indeed should he have done. And as many of us have been there, and he ends up marrying both sisters, now they're jealous. They enter into this, this childbearing war, right? And he ends up with two wives and 11 kids, as we saw, right? Which is absolutely insane. The struggle is real. And, and I think that oftentimes men struggle with not seeing God's plan more than women do. I think that men struggle with trying to intervene more, with trying to solve a problem more often than women do. And I think that because I believe by nature that we men, we at least think that we're fixers. Like we believe that we could fix absolutely everything. I have a spare, ba I have a, a, a spare bathroom and in there I have a toilet that has been broken for three years. But I'm going to fix it tomorrow. Because I don't need to call anybody because I can fix it. So I'm going to fix it tomorrow. Right? At, at, at least that's what I tell myself, right? Because I believe that I could fix just about anything. So we don't need to call anybody else. Where's Joey? I don't need to call anybody else. <laughs> because I could fix it. But it's not just, it's not just with, with things. It's also in life. Right? Like there's times, man, that Cindy wants to come and talk to me about a problem with whatever. And honestly, all she wants me to do is listen. But when... <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. But, but before she could even finish, in my mind, I've already solved it. It's already fixed. Will you just let me finish? Baby, you don't have to. I fixed it. I have the answer. If you would just listen. Man, we believe, man, we believe that if people would just listen to us, we can literally solve everything. The, <laughs> the biggest problem, however, is oftentimes we can't see God's plan in life. And it's impossible to fix things that you cannot see. And I know this firsthand. See, I'm not a handyman. I'm a lover man. Right? I'm a lover lover. Mm. Right? So, <laughs> so, I have... In, 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 my kitchen, in my kitchen sink, we have to have this bucket underneath our kitchen sink because there is this leak. <laughs> Where's Joe? <laughs> so, so I was like, babe, I can fix it. So uh, what I did was I, I, I made the mistake of not putting on gloves, and I got this silicone stuff, and I couldn't see where the leak was. So I get this the silicone all over my hands, and I just lube everything up. And would you believe somehow, some way, it's virtually impossible for it to happen? I missed the leak. <laughs> like, literally, everything else is gunked up to high heaven, except somewhere on that pipe where the actual leak is. And the problem is, is I can't see where the leak is, so therefore I can't fix it. So we just have to empty this bucket just about every other day. But... And Jacob can't see God's plan. He can't see what God's plan for his life with Leah was. The only thing he saw was the uglier wrong cousin. That's the only thing he saw. Not realizing, praise the Lord, not realizing that Leah would become the mother of Judah. Who from Judah would come David. And from the line of David would become Jesus Christ. The ultimate fulfilled promise of God himself. 
See, we can't see God's promises. We can't see God's plan all the time, and we try to intervene, and when we do, we mess everything up. And here's Jacob not waiting for God to reveal his plan to him, but yet he intervenes, and now his family once again is divided. Wives mad at each other and wives mad at him. Father-in-law cheating him uh, out of his wages and doing all kinds of insane things. And his life once again is in a mess. But we got to get to this point when we are trying to overcome obstacles. That we decide from this point forward, I will not turn back. See, your life may be a complete mess right now. You may be so far upside down you think that there was absolutely no way out but God gives us Jacob and look what God does for Jacob despite Jacob constantly messing everything up again and again and again and again God was still faithful to his promises still blessed him still caused his flocks to to multiply his finances to prosper God appears to him again just to remind him who he is. He says in 31, I'm the God of Bethel where you consecrated a pillar and made a vow to me. Now be on your way. Get out of this place. Go home to your birthplace. See, some of us are in a situation right now with God. That in order for you to have your, your breakthrough, in order for you to, to begin to prosper, in order for you to begin to be healed, in order for your uh, marriage to begin to be restored, in order for your life to begin to get the broken pieces picked up, you are at a place right now where you have to make that decision. Am I going to turn back to my mess or am I going to turn and follow God? And ultimately, what God is saying is come back to the house of God. Come back to the God of the house of God. But just like Jacob fashion, what he does is not confront his father-in-law to tell him the plans. What he does is he flees. And he flees and he begins to go back to an area. Uh, but the problem, uh, Cana, but the problem with this is this is where his brother is. Esau, remember from back when, his brother wanted to kill him. So again, Jacob does not seek God, but instead he sends out messengers to Esau to find Esau, to find out if, God, if Esau still wanted to kill him. His messengers come back and say, Esau, or, uh, Jacob, your brother Esau is coming, and he's bringing 400 men. 400. I don't know what that was. I should have done this. <laughs> but he's bringing 400 men. And it sets a panic into Jacob. And after the panic settles, he becomes brave. And what's he do? He sends out his warriors, his, his, wife, his wives and his kids. And he, he sends them out, right? He sends them out ahead of him, right? Well, that's, that, nothing says man like that. Psst, babe, I think someone's breaking in. Awesome. Baby, I'm going to get under the covers. Will you and the boys go check it out? <laughs> that's just wrong, right? So... So here he is, he, he, he sends out his wives and his kids, man, and he stays back. And now here we are, WWF, WWE wrestling match between God and Jacob. This is how we got here. And the bottom line of this whole match is it is not what it seems. This whole match is not, if you read it, it looks as though Jacob is holding his own against this man. But understand this, this man is God. And nobody, absolutely nobody holds their own against God. Yeah. Have you ever been in a fight in, or in a wrestling match that it just wasn't what it seemed? <laughs> right? Can you show that picture? <laughs> this was at a Christmas party and, 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 and she was I'm sure talking smack and she's probably getting more presents because she's the favorite and I had enough of it but, um, but what's crazy is as, as I'm, I'm, I'm just getting ready just to destroy her finish her right? and I'm getting ready just to take her out she begins biting And the two things, two things about this is as she's biting, she's thinking she's biting me. 
My hands are here. So she's really thinking that she's getting me. I mean, she's... Right? The other thing she's doing is she's saying, Stop biting me! Right? So people at the party are weak because one, she thinks she's biting me, but also in her mind, I'm biting her hand. <laughs> when, as you can see, there is nothing that I am biting. <laughs> she is biting her own hand, right? <laughs> she about ate her knuckle off. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But in her mind, man, she is, she is just, she's taking it to me in, in, in this vicious dog attack. Right? But it's not what it seems. When you read this, Jacob is taking it to God. Right? He's taking it to God. Let me, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But this is not what it seems. See, God is entertaining him because truth be told, what Jacob is doing at this very moment is once again manipulating. And now he's trying to manipulate God himself. And he does this, by, this manipulation to God by saying, God, uh, 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 I won't let go until you. Manipulation. Anybody in here ever manipulate God? God, if you do this, then I'll do that. Manipulation. See, chances are every single person in here has tried to manipulate God. This man, God, says, let me go. As if Jacob had God pinned. But I could prove, truth be told, that that's not the case. I won't let you go until you bless me. Craziest thing is, is neither one of us have to ever, ever wrestle with God to receive the promises that he has already promised to give us. All we simply have to do is begin to receive them. If this was truly a match, God wouldn't have touched his socket and popped his hip out of, out of joint. He would have ripped his arm or his leg off and beat him to death with it. Right? I mean, truth be told, if this was a real wrestling match, what this was was an amazing daddy who was entertaining his kid. That's all. It was like me wrestling my sister. It's like me wrestling my boys. Right? They can't do what it is unless I allow them to do it. They can't pin me down. I lay myself down. I don't have to bite because she's going to bite her own hand off. <laughs> Right? And Jacob, truth be told, man, is no match for God. And when we say things like, you know, people say things all the time like, sometimes you just got to wrestle God and you got to demand your blessings. Right? You can just debunk that with two words. You're stupid. Right? Because, no, you're stupid. <laughs> but, but think about that, man. You cannot wrestle God. Nobody has ever wrestled God. Real talk. Amen. Even when we say these, I mean, I wrestled God all night last night. No, I promise you, you didn't. No, Pastor, for real, I didn't. No, you didn't. Well, how do you know? Because you're standing in front of me. Right. You're not dead, hence, number one, you didn't wrestle God. You're not walking with a limp, hence, number two, you're not wrestling God. For a lot of us, we don't even have self-control to stay out of sin. We're not going to have self-control to stay in a wrestling match. <laughs> Right? So, no, we don't wrestle God. We have an amazing daddy who will sometimes entertain you. Why? Because there's something greater. This would be like me wrestling Pastor Rob. (laughs) Right? And just taking it to Pastor Rob, right? And just, "Ah, no, man. It's not going to happen. I promise you I'm not going to pin him. (laughs) Right? I'm not going to take him out. Now, he might entertain me. Ah, ooh, ah, pastor. Oh, my, oh man. Oh, mercy. Okay, ooh, ooh, ooh. You got, you got, you got me, soldier. You got me, pastor. Okay. Let me go. I'm not going to let you go until you give me what I need. I want you to die. You know what I'm saying? 
Okay, okay. I, you, 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 your wish is my command. You know what I'm saying? No, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Right? It's absolutely ridiculous. If y'all walked in and I was like, man, y'all just missed it. Man, I just uh, pinned Pastor Rob in the most epic wrestling match ever. Y'all going to be like, oh, Pastor is so cute. Right. And in your mind, you're going to think, uh, lion little sucker. <laughs> there is no way that he just pinned Pastor Rob. So too with us, man. We don't pin God because we're never going to get in a position where we can pin God. Here's Jacob, and this was supposed to be a wrestling match. It was as real as a wrestling match is as WWF and WWE is. It wasn't real, but it goes back to God's plan. Like, why didn't he just stop it? Because he had a greater purpose that we can't see. Here's Jacob holding on for dear life, believing in his mind he's wrestling God, but yet he's still going about it the wrong way as so many of us are. We're trying to get blessings from God by our own power, believing that indeed we have to begin to earn them. If I do this, then God has to do that. And God is simply showing Jacob how madly and passionately in love with Jacob that he is. And he's letting Jacob know that, man, my blessings are not something that you earn. They're not something that you get on your own power. Jacob's promises, Jacob's blessings, your promises, your blessings are not something that we do. It's something that God gives by God's grace. It has nothing to do with us but everything to do with him. Jacob, like so many of us, is a liar, a con artist, a deceiver, a thief, a runner, a weasel. And on top of that, he's trying to earn God's blessings on his own merit. Most of us wrestle not with God, but with the things that we do for God. And we wrestle with the things that we do for God because we believe that since I did this for God, then God should do this for me. So ultimately what it comes down to is not a blessing issue, but a pride issue. I'm not doing this to bring God glory. I'm doing this because I want something out of it. And we begin to get into this wrestling match with what it is that we do for God. So ultimately, it's not even God we wrestle with. It's our pride that we're wrestling with. But God will intervene oftentimes so that we will have somebody other than self to begin to talk to. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Okay, okay, you're so cute. Yeah, pin me for a second. Oh, wow, you're so strong. When ultimately all God's doing is saying, I'm getting ready to destroy you mentally to begin to rebuild you because I can't do anything with your mindset when your mind is set on Jacob you con artist deceiving conniving little punk but when I begin to break you down and show you that that's not who you are to get out of your own way, but to show you that you are Israel, God's chosen nation. When you are Israel, the promise of God, when you are Israel, and then you will begin to grab a hold of who you truly are. And that's the only reason why I begin to entertain you in this wrestling match. See, when I wrestle with my boys, man, it's amazing bonding time, but I also get to teach them things. God is wrestling with Jacob, man, ultimately for a bonding uh, 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 session, but also he gets to teach uh, Jacob things. He gets to teach him who he truly is. And this is what Paul is saying in Romans about us wrestling, or uh, in, in, in Philippians, when Paul says that we are wrestling with our pride. This is a fake wrestling match because it feels so good to, to believe we earned it. Nothing's given to me. I, I, I earned this. We live in a society, man, where, where one, we think things should be given to us, and then the other half of the people, man, believe that they have to do everything to get something. Instead of just simply submitting to God, waiting on God, listening to his promises, listening to his word, and seeing what it is, that how it is, he's getting ready to blow your mind. What's your name? Jacob. No longer is Israel. You are the prince of with God, Israel. That's amazing. It's awesome how the, the word of God lets us know we can be a villain. If I could have our worship team come up. It's amazing how, how the word of God will let us know that we could be a villain one minute with God. 
And then the very next minute that we could be a prince with God or a princess with God. God's chosen nation, which is symbolic to God choosing Jacob, despite, just like today, church, God is choosing you. Jacob leaves this wrestling match with a limp. A constant reminder of who God is. And in one touch, what God could do. But it's also a constant reminder of the wonderful, beautiful, peaceful, faithful God that it is that we serve. That is still so faithful in keeping a promise despite how faithless oftentimes we can become. Jacob, truth be told, man, would struggle with waiting on God for the rest of his life. But God never struggled with delivering a promise to Jacob. And he was true to his promise when he named him Israel. He did indeed make him into a mighty nation. God begins to restore Jacob's family. God changed the heart of his father-in-law for his father-in-law to stop to pursue him. God changed the heart of Esau that Esau no longer wanted to kill his brother. But when he saw his brother, he weeped, embraced, and kissed him. And then said, look, I know right now you have nowhere to live. So why don't you and your family, your two wives and 147 kids, come and move in with me. But Jacob... Reverting back from Israel mentality to now Jacob mentality begins to believe that his brother is still wanting to kill him. So he sends his brother on ahead. He says that we'll catch up later. And indeed that later doesn't come. What he ends up doing is he goes the opposite direction. Gets 10 miles from Bethel, 10 miles from the house of God. That's a little bit too uncomfortable, so he turns the other way and ends up 20 miles north, and he takes problems into his own hands and ultimately settles outside the ungodly Canaanite city of Shechem, and everything goes wrong. His daughter is kidnapped and, and, and raped. His sons take revenge on every man in the city, and they kill them. His life is destroyed once again and he's running for it once again you ever been there like have you ever been there man like like everything's going good and then you make one stupid decision and everything just begins to fall apart and then that one stupid decision starts a domino effect and you stop seeking god on the decisions that it is that you're making so everything just becomes absolutely devastating and now here he is and he places his family in danger and finally out of desperation which is a beautiful place to be out of desperation Jacob calls out to God and what I love so much about my God if you don't know him I love to introduce you to him he doesn't ignore him. well Jacob I was with you but you left me so no I'm not gonna listen to you he calls out to God and God appears to him once again and God tells him to get back to Bethel get back to Bethel and make another altar and he also tells him he says have your family put away strange gods or false idols have them change their clothes and thank you Jesus finally Jacob gathers his family makes another wise decision demands his family to put away false gods to put away these false idols change your clothes he says and let's begin to look act and live as though we are people of God Almighty he finally became the leader that God ordained God wanted him to be the whole time and now here's Jacob marching his family back to Bethel he's marching his family back to the house of God but what's so amazing about this is when he marches his family back to the house of God a place that he's been so close so many times but yet never committed this time he's finally 100% committed and when he gets there when he gets to Bethel and he begins to make this other altar you know what's amazing is he names it El Bethel which is now the God of the house of God 
What I love so much about that is Jacob is wanting the readers to know. He's wanting the family to know. He's wanting everybody to know. I didn't return my family to the house of God for everything to be restored. I turned me and my family back to God. And because I turned them back to God, everything was restored. And now since I turned my family back to God, we will be committed to the house of God. So he names it El Bethel. Jacob wanted to make it clear on who it was that radically changed his life. He wanted to make it clear it's no house, it's no building. It's the God of the house. It's the God of the building. See, God changed Jacob's life, not the church, but God. The church can't change your life today, but God can he ends it in, in 47.9 with saying, man, my, my years were many, uh, 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 my years may have been few and difficult, but you know what's awesome? God had a plan. He had a plan before Jacob was born. Unfortunately, Jacob oftentimes tried to intervene as oftentimes me and you do. It brought suffering, it brought heartache, it brought pain. Instead of waiting on God, he tried to do everything himself. But... What he did do, which is absolutely amazing, is in desperation, he called out to God. So I pray that today, if you are here, and your life is flipped upside down, that in desperation, you will call out to God. God restored the years that, that Jacob went running from him. He restored the brokenness of, of, of what Jacob caused. God did amazing things through Jacob, who became Israel all because of God's wonderful, wonderful promises. So it's not enough just to go to church. It's not enough just to be involved in church. What you need to do is turn to the God of the church, God Almighty, Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit is here today to lead you to him. Father God, we thank you. God, we praise you. We love you. We give you all glory. And we just ask you, my King, that you would just have your way. I pray today, God, for the Jacobs who are in here, my Lord Jesus, that they would realize who you are, God. That they would desire today, my Lord God, to become Israel. That they would desire today to cry out in desperation to El Bethel, the God of the house of God, God Almighty, <laughs> that today they would receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, my Lord, and they would step into their forgiveness, that unconditional love, that they would wear righteousness and walk in the freedom of redemption. If that's anybody here today, it's awesome that you came to Bethel, the house of God. But my desire before you leave is that you would turn to El Bethel, the God of this house, Jesus our Christ. That's you simply open up your heart right where you sit. We're going to have everybody repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a Jacob in the need of a Savior. There's only one. It's you. I thank you. For your transformation that I will go from Jacob to Israel I'm all yours <clears throat> use me lead guide direct me Holy Spirit fill me baptize me in your glory in your power and in your presence I'm all yours and all God's baby said Hallelujah, church, stand to your feet. Man, if you want prayer, we have some mighty men and women who will be up here to pray with you. Listen, we love y'all in a crazy way, but remember, Jesus Christ is madly and passionately in love with each and every single one of you. Amen. Now get out there and be the hands and the feet of Jesus our Christ.